so for today's movie review, I'll be reviewing Captain Marvel. Sorry, I meant Shazam, the overall seventh installment of the DC Extended Universe that is directed by David F. Sandberg, the same guy who directed horror movies Lights Out, which I thought was okay but forgettable, to the Annabelle prequel, Annabelle Creation. And yeah, as far as the actual comic book history to Shazam goes, it's pretty complicated. And it goes something like this. Fawcett Comics, during the golden age of comic books, created Captain Marvel, and DC Comics actually sued Fawcett Comics since DC claimed that Captain Marvel was way too similar to Superman, even though the creator of Captain Marvel stated that his character was completely different from Superman. Although, according to some sources, DC sued Fawcett Comics not because Captain Marvel was very similar to that of Superman, it's believed that the real reason behind DC Comics suing Fawcett Comics was due to the fact that Captain Marvel, during the golden age of comic books, was by far the most popular superhero around this time period, even more so than DC's Superman. And DC saw this as a threat and wanted to take Fawcett Comics to court for infringement to copyright, claiming that Captain Marvel was a mere image of Superman. Even though, like I said earlier, Fawcett stated that Captain Marvel was completely different than Superman. And sometime later, Fawcett Fawcett Comics decided to stop publishing Captain Marvel altogether due to the court case. Sometime during the 1970s, Fawcett Comics sold the character rights of Captain Marvel to DC. And since then, DC Comics has incorporated the Captain Marvel and the Marvel family into their DC universe. However, around this time period, there was yet another conflict over Captain Marvel because by this time period, Marvel Comics created their own character of Captain Marvel and trademarked the name. Due to this trademark, DC is not allowed to publish any Captain Marvel comics under the Captain Marvel banner, which is why back in 2011, during DC's big relaunch of their comic book properties, the Captain Marvel titles were renamed to Shazam. Although another popular theory as to why DC renamed Captain Marvel to Shazam has to do with the fact that a lot of casual comic book readers refer to Captain Marvel as Shazam, even though Shazam's the name of the wizard. But anywho, when it came to watching this movie, I originally didn't even want to see Shazam in the theaters because when I saw the trailer for the movie back in 2018 during the Comic-Con week, the trailer didn't really look all that good to me to a point that this movie did not look like an actual theater theatrical movie, it looks more like a TV made movie that would take place within the same universe as the CW's Arrowverse than the DC Extended Universe that for some reason got a theatrical release. And to add on top of that, I never really was the biggest fan of the Shazam character because I always found the idea of the character to be silly to a point that I never really took him seriously. And to put things in perspective, growing up, I took Aquaman more seriously than Billy Baxton's character. But after hearing some positive word of mouth about the movie and the fact that this is yet another installment of the DC Extent Universe and still living by the philosophy of, you know, I'm going to check out all the other installments of this franchise because Man of Steel was the very first movie review I ever did on this channel, I figured, you know what, I might as well watch it to see rather not this movie's any good. And here I am doing a movie review of Shazam. And the big question is, is Shazam a better Captain Marvel movie than the MCU's Captain Marvel? As for the plot of the movie, while being a nuisance to both child services and the authorities, 14-year-old Billy Baxton is transferred to his latest foster home, where Billy quickly becomes friends with one of the other foster kids named Freddie Freeman, who turns out to be a really big fan and as superheroes. And one day at school, Billy saves his new foster family member Freddy from a group of bullies who proceed to chase him onto a subway. Sometime later, Billy is transported to a magical temple called the Rock of Eternity where he meets an ancient wizard named Shazam. And upon meeting the wizard, Billy is transformed into an adult superhero who has powers from various gods and demigods. Sometime later, Billy reveals his adult form to Freddy, and the two of them try to make sense of Billy's superhero form as Billy proceeds to have some adult-sized 
fun in his new superhero form. However, a threat in the form of a mad scientist named Dr. Savannah soon shows up to challenge Billy for his superpowers. Can Billy Baxton master his newly required superpowers in order to take on the mad scientist, or will Dr. Savannah succeed in obtaining Billy's superpowers? In terms of what I liked about the movie, I love the setting in terms of both location and season, because the movie takes place in Philadelphia, which I find to be very refreshing considering that most superhero movies take place in New York City, so it is nice to see a superhero movie take place in a city that's well known but not as well known as New York. And I think the filmmakers do a good job of using the city to their advantage in terms of showing off various landmarks that the city has to offer. Then of course you have the time of year in which the movie takes place, which is around Christmas, making this the overall third superhero movie to my memory to take place around Christmas, the other two being Batman Returns and Iron Man 3. However, unlike Batman Returns and Iron Man 3, I consider Shazam to be a Christmas Christmas movie because with Batman Returns and Iron Man 3, those two movies are just set around Christmas just to be set around Christmas and really don't tie into the movie's story in a thematical sense. With Shazam on the other hand, it is a Christmas movie not because it's set around Christmas or plays Christmas music. But Shazam is a Christmas movie because it has one common element with all other Christmas movies, that being an emotional drive that revolves around family. Since Billy's character arc throughout this whole movie is him trying to find a family and place to call home, which is why he spends the first third of the movie looking for his real mother. And by the time we reach the end of Act 3, we see Billy go through his character arc of accepting this foster home and family as his real home and family, thus making Shazam a Christmas movie. Another aspect to this movie that I thought worked well for Shazam is the movie's consistent tone from start to finish. Because when you really look at this movie, tonally speaking, it's all over the place. Considering that this movie goes from being campy to scary and dramatic dramatic quite a bit throughout Shazam's runtime. And on pen and paper, you think a movie that has this many tonal shifts would not work, yet somehow the filmmakers found a way to interweave all three tones into one movie in a very smart way, where they predominantly have all the campy moments revolved around Billy when he's in his Shazam persona. They keep mainly the scary stuff with Dr. Savannah anytime he shows up using the seven deadly sins of man. And the movie has a lot of dramatic moments revolve around Billy when he's just himself. And the more I thought about it, Shazam totally reminded me of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie from 2002, since that movie went through very similar tonal shifts, going back and forth between being campy, scary, to being dramatic, without compromising the movie as a whole, making Shazam the 2019 equivalent to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movie in regards to how it handles its tone. I also thought that the movie had a really good sense of humor humor in regards to how it handled its jokes, since most of them are very quick and straight to the point, unlike some of the more recent installments of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, in which you have a joke being told, and instead of being shortened to the point, the movie really tries to extend that joke to milk as much laughter out of the audience as much as possible. I'm also happy that the movie didn't compare itself to the Tom Hanks movie movie big, considering that both movies have a very similar premise in which a kid becomes an adult through magical means, because my biggest worry going into this movie was that the characters within Shazam were constantly going to compare themselves to Big in some shape or form. Thankfully, they only make one reference towards Big, which happens to take the form of the giant keyboard in the toy store. And, in my opinion, I think the joke revolving around that giant keyboard has the best punchline in the entire movie. Another aspect of the movie that I really liked revolves around Dr. Servana, because if you've seen some of my other movie reviews revolved around 
various MCU movies or even the occasional DC movie here and there, you would know that I really don't like it when filmmakers have the main hero battle a villain, which in some shape or form is just an evil version of themselves. As I pointed out in my review of Black Panther, with this movie on the other hand, our main villain, Dr. Zervana, kind of falls into that category of super villain that basically serves as a evil reflection of our main hero. Keyword, kinda. For example, even though Dr. Zervana has superpowers that are very similar to that of Shazam's, the origin behind them is very different, which I really do appreciate considering that the filmmakers so easily could have had Sravana be a kid like Billy and obtain the powers of the seven deadly sins of man and anytime you see Sravana and Billy fight it out in not their true forms but their adult personas which would sound really hysterical but thankfully the filmmakers don't go in that direction and have Sravana be an adult when he obtains those powers and in the process giving him some bills and whistles over Billy which take the form of the seven deadly sins of man which I do have problems with, which I'll talk about later, but overall, Dr. Servana is a refreshing take on the whole evil reflection villain archetype that we see in so many superhero movies. And speaking of other superhero movies, Shazam is very similar to Aquaman in one of two ways. The first being that both movies function very well as a standalone installment of the DC Extended Universe in that sense where you really don't need to watch any of the other movies to understand them, while the other aspect revolves around the filmmaker's willingness to embrace the ridiculousness of its source material by having fun with it. Also, I think Shazam does a better job of establishing the mystical aspect of this universe as opposed to some other movies such as Suicide Squad or Wonder Woman where they introduce the concepts of magic but they don't really explore them, while Shazam on the other hand really explores the mystical aspects of this universe and does a good job of embracing said aspect. Case in point, what other superhero movie are you going to find in which a kid opens a door and encounters three bipedal crocodile men? I also thought that the acting was pretty good, especially coming from Zachary Levi, because although I'm not the first to bring this up, I do think the actor does a good job of playing a adult form of Billy when he's Shazam, because anytime you have a movie in which a kid becomes an adult, such as the case with Big, normally you have the kid act one way, but when they become an adult, the adult actor plays an over-exaggerated version of the kid. With Zachary Levi, on the other hand, anytime you see him on screen acting, he does truly act like his younger counterpart, so there's a consistency there. Also, I do like that this movie features features John Glover, which I thought was a nice touch considering that the actor has played in other DC properties before, such as playing the Riddler in Batman the Animated Series or Dr. Jason Rodero in the now infamous 1997 superhero movie Batman and Robin. Who plays the estranged father of Dr. Zervana in this movie? Now we get into the review in which I discuss the aspects of the movie that I have mixed feelings about, starting with Mark Strong playing the role of Dr. Zervana. Because on the one hand, I think Mark Strong turns in a good performance as Dr. Zervana, and I also think Dr. Zervana in and of itself is not only one of the better villains to exist within DC movies in general, but probably one of the better supervillains to appear in a comic book movie during the 2010s. I think my major problem with his casting is I personally think Mark Strong would have made for a better Lex Luthor as opposed to Jesse Eisenberg playing the role of Lex Luthor back in Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice who not only turned in a terrible performance but he also thought he was playing a completely different character because according to one source apparently Jesse Eisenberg 
Gutenberg thought he was playing the Riddler and not Lex Luthor for some reason. But anywho, I personally think Mark Strong would have made a fantastic Lex Luthor if the script was good. Another aspect to the movie I have mixed feelings towards is the overall production values in regards to the movie's costuming and special effects. Starting with the costuming, because I do think that Shazam's costume looks very accurate to the comics and looks good, but my only gripes I have with the costume itself revolve around the lightning bolt on Shazam's chest along with the golden boots. Those to me look very fake and plasticky to me. As for some of the other production values that the movie has going for it, I think some of the set designs are really good, especially the Rock of Eternity. That to me looked great. As for the CGI, on the other hand, it's all over the place. For example, anytime we see Billy and Dr. Savannah using their lightning-based abilities, or seeing the wizard Shazam using his staff to show Billy the backstory of both Black Adam along with the Seven Deadly Sins using the magical holograms, I think look okay, but then there's a lot of CGI in certain points that look really bad. Some examples I can think of off the top of my head, one of them occurs early on in the movie where we see the female psychologist getting disintegrated by the door. That to me looked horrendous, along with the Seven Deadly Sins, which I'll talk about later, but because of this movie's questionable production values, I almost really don't get a sense that this movie takes place within the DC Extended Universe. It almost feels as if Warner Brothers and DC told the producers over at the CW to make a TV made movie focused on Shazam that takes place within the CW's Arrowverse comprising of their TV shows Arrow, The Flash, and The Legends of Tomorrow, but somehow ended up getting a theatrical release. Now, in terms of what I disliked about the movie, the pacing in certain points in time can be all over the place. Because for the first 20 minutes of the movie, the pacing is a tad bit slow going at first, but once we see Dr. Savannah obtain the power of the seven deadly sins, then the movie gradually picks up its pacing. Where it doesn't move too fast, but it moves just fast enough to get you from one scene to the next. Although the movie does suffer from having some severe second act blues, in which the movie does decide to slow its pacing down quite a bit, but once once the last third of the movie starts, the pacing picks back up again. And speaking of the last third, next few problems occur during the last third of the movie. One of them being how Billy and his foster family discover Dr. Savannah's weakness. Because when you have Billy and Dr. Savannah in the Stone of Eternity, and you get that whole scene where Freddy throws the battering replica at Dr. Savannah when all the seven deadly sins are out of his body, Billy puts two and two together right then and there that Dr. Savannah is as weakest when the seven deadly sins are inside of him. And moments later, we get into that huge chase where we go go from the Stone of Eternity to the Winter Carnival, and Billy never says anything to his foster family about this particular weakness, and upon seeing Dr. Safana unleashing the sin wrath upon Billy to fight against, somehow both Freddy and Mary come to the same exact conclusion that Billy came to when they were back at the Stone of Eternity, which makes no sense whatsoever, because when Billy put two and two together, this situation made sense to me considering that not only did he see the injury that Dr. Savannah received, but he also saw it disappear once the sins and re-entered his body. Yeah, when Freddie and Mary put two and two together, it's during a point in time where Dr. Savannah did not sustain an injury. Maybe I'm remembering details differently, but how Freddie and Mary came to the same conclusion that Billy did in terms of figuring out Savannah's weakness is beyond me. I also feel that the introduction of the shit Sam family in this movie was a bit too soon and probably should have been saved for a Shazam sequel, but the way in which the Shazam family is interwoven within Billy's character arc I think makes sense within the context of the movie in terms of why we would get introduced to 
to the Shazam family this early on. And before I go any further, to clarify what I mean by the whole Shazam family, it's the moment in time when you see Billy's foster family become the adult superheroes. That's what I'm talking about. But anywho, another problem I had during this climax, before we see Billy transform his foster siblings into the Shazam family, we see Billy battling Wrath, and he can't physically land a physical punch on Wrath due to Wrath constantly transforming into mist the entire time, which makes it harder for Billy to fight Wrath. Yet, after we see Billy's foster family become the Shazam family, and we see them battling the Seven Deadly Sins, there's actually several moments in time where Pedro can physically land a punch on Wrath. And for some reason, even though the Seven Deadly Sins themselves do have the ability to transform to mist at will, they never transform into mist when battling the Shazam family. Not sure why, but they don't. And speaking of the Seven Deadly Sins, another problem I have with the movie revolves around the Seven Deadly Sins from a visual aesthetic. Now sure, I know that in the comics they've gone through several design variations over the years, sporting some very imaginative designs that best represent each and every single Deadly Sin. As far as their movie counterparts are concerned, we get seven generic looking demons, which to me was very disappointing considering that I think that the filmmakers could have pushed the designs to each sin a a little further in some shape or form. And on top of that, the combination of the motion capture and CGI used for the Seven Deadly Sins to me is perhaps the worst aspect of the movie considering that the motion capture and CGI doesn't really look all that great to me. I also feel that the Seven Deadly Sins themselves, even though they're a major part of the movie, were very underutilized in some cases because all they do really is escape eat several board members, and then proceed to fight the Shazam family. That's about it. Now, personally, the way I would have integrated the Seven Deadly Sins into the plot, maybe after the board meeting with Servana and the Seven Deadly Sins killing all of the board members of his father's company, maybe they find out that Billy has become Shazam, and Servana decides to divide and conquer and sends out the Seven Deadly Sins to look for Billy across the city in human disguises. And then maybe you have one of the Seven Deadly Sins encounter Billy during that one part of the movie where he rescues the people on the bus. Then you proceed to have one of the Seven Deadly Sins fight Billy and somehow this alerts Dr. Savannah and the other Sins to converge at that location, fighting Billy, overwhelming him in the process, forcing him to retreat, and maybe give them some characterization where you see them interacting with each other when Servana's not around, and you see them revealing their true colors in terms of what they want to do with Servana, or something like that. Basically, give the Seven Deadly Sins a big role within the context of the movie, other than stand around and fight the Shazam family. So, for my final verdict of Shazam, initially when I went to go see this movie in theaters, I went in with very low expectations because I didn't think this movie was going to be that good. But upon watching it, Shazam was a lot better than I thought it was originally going to be. Because going into this, I was expecting this movie to be basically big mixed with Superman. And, for the most part, it is. But it's also a mixture of other movies like Monster Squad along with the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie. And you basically get Shazam in a nutshell. Also, out of any any of the movies to take place within the DC Extended Universe, I think Shazam is the second best installment of the DC Extended Universe. Also, to on top of that, Shazam is a different kind of superhero movie to come out of the 2010s because the movie itself doesn't feel like a superhero movie to come from the 2010s. If anything, Shazam feels like a throwback to superhero movies from the early 2000s like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Although the movie does have some problems to it like slow pace scene, the story having very predictable beats to its budget, which makes the movie look less like an actual theatrical release to making it look more like a TV-made movie. So, overall, Shazam is a much better Captain Marvel movie than the actual Captain Marvel movie starring Brie Larson. And before I give my final rating, what did everyone else have to say about Shazam?
So it looks like the movie got generally positive reception. And so for my final rating of Shazam, I give it a 4 out of 5. So when it comes to the character of Billy Baxton, how do you prefer to call him? Do you prefer to call him Shazam or Captain Marvel? And see you later.